Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Ramsey. I will be the moderator for this session, which is titled How Purdue University Has Benefited from the Use of Unitime and Open Source Practices. The presenter for this session will be Stephanie Schluttenhofer. Please leave yourselves muted and cameras turned off during the presentation. All right. Thank you, Derek. Um, as Derek said, I'm Stephanie Schlettenhofer. I'm going to be talking about how Purdue has benefited from unit time and open source practices. Um, among these benefits um, come from the adaptability that open source practice processes and dialogue bring. Um, there's also a lot of data within unit time that is very easily accessible. And this brings a lot of um, ability for planning and cost savings. And there's also just the um, ease that Unitime can be integrated with other systems through some of our open interfaces. Um, and this really has resulted in um, improved form performance and produce fundamental mission of educating its students. So I'm gonna start with talking about uh, adaptability that comes from open source processes, which encourage dialogue and innovation. Um, one of my observations um, from traditional software vendors, and before my life at Purdue, I did work in a more traditional environment. And um, so I, I've kind of seen it from both sides. One of those is that traditional software, the users, they learn how the software works and they use it and they report bugs, but they don't get response very quickly on those bugs unless it's just something critical and work stopping, at which point, yes, they'll get a fix, but often they have to wait. And if they request additional functionality, it can take years for them to get an upgrade that has that. Um, and as a result, they kind of just become disengaged from the software. This is what it is, this is how it works. There's not a lot of excitement around it. And the software is kind of stale. Um, what I've observed in working in open source is the users learn the software and they're aware that it's open source and changes can happen. So they'll often ask, could the software do uh, I don't know, X? And this community says, oh yes, X is a great idea. Um, you know what that data we get from doing X, we could also probably do Y pretty easily. And users are going, oh yeah, that would be great. And could you add Z in? And these changes get implemented quickly, and the users are engaged with this process. And to be honest, um, the developers, the community members, they're engaged too because they get excited when they can do something that excites their users. And this engagement leads to the software being far more adaptable. Um, and I'm going to do a case study uh, with Purdue on their advisor recommendation form. This came in a um, couple of years ago. Um, our users asked, can Unitime replace this paper course request form the advisors are filling out? Um, this kind of mirrors the course request form being filled out in Unitime, and um, we need to really be able to track this paper um, uploaded into systems. So um, we'd like this to be able to be saved as a PDF that can be uploaded into other systems and also something that students could buy, sign as proof of their advising conversation. And, you know, it'd really be nice if the students could see this in unit time. So we looked at the form and said, well, let's see what's on this form. You know, there's information in the head of the form. This is completely new, but it's not that difficult to do. And, you know, in addition to um, giving the student their pin off this form so they could register, you know, we could just go ahead and enable them for registration. And if the student advisor releases the pin, they can just go ahead and register. So, yeah, we like this and, yeah, we can do that. Yes, the body of this form looks an awful lot like what the students has. Definitely, we can use this as a starting point. And, you know, in addition to what you said, we show from the dashboard kind of what the students have already done. You know, that'd probably be useful information for you to have what the student has already done in the system to look at whenever you're advising them. So let's pull that piece of information in as well. So we propose, you know, here's this new online form. You can enable the students. You can see what they've got and you can put in course requests and you can make notes and it'll tally up the credits and everything else. And when you're done, you can submit it and it will provide you with a downloadable PDF that you can either print out and have the students sign or you can 
upload into other systems easily. And the advisors really like this. And then we also said, you know, in addition to this, um, we'll um, give the students a button on the page, which will pop up the form for them. And that way the students can all readily see it whenever they're within unit time trying to register for their courses. And on top of that, you know what? We could go ahead and put all of these courses on that you've told them to take on their course request form and sort of tell them, hey, this is what your advisor told you to do. Hit the submit button and you're done. So this sort of reinforces the advising um, communication and you know, you should be doing what your advisor tells you to do. And the advisors really like that. So we did this and turned it around in basically three months from being this being brought in as an idea. We did a few rounds of feedback, put something together. The advisors tested it and trained it in February of 2020. And it went in production on March 14th of 2020, which really was advantageous because COVID hit, um, advising went online, and this form facilitated that online communication when the students are being advised for what they should take for the upcoming fall. Um, we really had phenomenally high usage among our advisors. Um, and because it did a lot of the things they had requested, they were engaged with the form. And even now they regularly suggest ideas of improvements and we listen to them and we often, and we will implement them and we often expand on what they um, request. And so at this point for fall 2022, during the pre-registration cycle, we had around 26,000 students or so. This form was used to advise all but 50 of those students. And of those 50, we suspect they had just gotten in before they had been locked out and had to go through the advising with their, from their advisors. So, I mean, this is a really high engagement rate among the advisors on this form. Um, pretty much all of our advisors use it to advise their students and they like it and they keep telling us how to make it better. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more of this, I have a lightning talk this afternoon where I'm going to do a quick pass through um, the form and it, how the advisors use it. Um, you're welcome to show up and um, watch. Beyond that, you know, time has a lot of data that is very useful for planning and it's used in a lot, a lot of different ways. There's short term planning, um, which I mean, you have your curricular data, your enrollment and your student requests. Um, this is, you know, time uses this to build the timetable, um, it knows what courses have joint demand, it makes sure they don't conflict. Um, you can do projections so you can see where you're having increased demand or decreased demand and do the appropriate thing with it. Um, you can um, look and see how things are filling and if you need to open up more seats. So these are all things for short term. Another thing, whenever you're planning your term, you can use this data to predict, okay, this department's going to need a couple more classrooms than we gave them last year to, in order to build their schedule. Um, this department is going to need um, a larger classroom than we had given them the last term, or maybe a smaller classroom. And you can sort of um, shift around the pool of rooms you're giving each department to use for their um, local departmental problems in order to properly plan. Another thing that can be done for long term is, as you're watching the trends in the data term after term, you can see that you know, we're going to have a need for um, 150 size classrooms. We're starting to get more and more classes there and we're getting a little tight there. The next building we build in the future might wanna have a classroom in that size. Another thing we have is a lot of GPS data. So you can say, and we should put that in a building that's more central to class based on where that the demand for that size of a classroom is. Um, and it gives you a feel for, are we gonna need this in two years, four years, eight years, kind of, you can project out. Um, so it's very useful for that. Um, and in the very long term, Purdue has taken advantage of this by running simulations of what it would look like in 10 years from now. It 
kind of put together its composition of a dream student body. Sort of said, okay, we want to grow this major. We're going to shrink this one. We're going to overall increase the, our student population. And so, and this is what we want the makeup to be. So we take that from unit time. We kind of project that on the current student body, increase um, the, the number of students and majors they want to grow and decrease the others and things like that. And we generate course demands and say, okay, well, for the courses you're currently offering, yeah, we know you're not going to be offering the exact courses in 10 years, but just pretend that these would be the courses and the curriculum while changing, may, they're going to have a similar makeup. So the people familiar with the program, we okay, um, this is how we're going to ha handle the growth and shrinkage. And we took that and we simulated a course timetable. We added sections where things were growing and no, there aren't, there are never going to be rooms that take section sizes that big. So you're going to have to add sections um, where they could, they increase section sizes. If classes were, demand was shrinking, they occasionally shrunk the courses. Um, they got rid of rooms that were slated to be torn down. They added the rooms expected to be built. And as they were, we were building this timetable, if we just didn't have rooms to handle the need of what we were expecting to have in 10 years, we invented rooms and kept track of that. And then we, once we had a timetable that took all this into account, we simulated the students and made sure that they um, we had a usable timetable, that this wasn't something that would be worthless if we tried to put through a set of students that matched their dream population. And from that, we analyzed what came out. You could see which departments would are go, were going to need to add additional staff. You have your service departments um, that offer courses everyone takes. If you increase students, yeah, you're going to um, need to increase um, um, faculty in those service departments. But depending on the makeup of what you increase, are you increasing faculty for chemistry and physics or language courses, things like that. So it kind of gave a good feel for where um, hiring would need to be. And what sort of departments are they just, they're not going to get the new faculty. They're going to have to make do. Um, and then are the rooms we planned the rooms we're going to need? And the rooms we had to add to make this work, what are we going to do to make sure we've got those in 10 years? So a lot of that was done. And that leads to cost savings because, you know, what are the right classes to offer? Where are you going to focus your resources in faculty hiring? You don't want to be hiring in the, the departments that are shrinking. You want to be hiring in the areas that are growing. Knowing what types of spaces to build and where, and to be honest, knowing what types of spaces not to build. Um, if there's a lab that's basically um, technology is going in a direction that you're not going to use that lab in the future. Don't build a new lab of that type. Um, and so all this leads to cost savings by avoiding wasteful spe spending on unneeded resources. And this cost savings, I mean, this um, also is felt by the students. Number one, they have like the advisor recommendation for them gives them better planning and interactions with their advisors. They know what they're taking, supposed to be taking and they're sort of put on a track to where they more re, more are more likely to actually follow their advice. So that keeps them on track. They're able to get the courses they need to graduate on time. And so they are not having to pay for extra terms. Plus the cost savings Purdue realizes is also passed on to the students. Um, we haven't raised tuition in 10 years. Personally, I'd like to think that um, Unitime has helped be part of that endeavor. Um, another thing where we've reaped benefits is the integration, um, which allows data to be um, passed all over the institution. Um, as you can see, we've got I've got a chart that was made a couple years ago that has Unitime in the center and all of the contact points with Unitime. We send data all over. For us, it's very quick and easy to create a user interface. Um, if it's just simple data, we can create a report and um, give a system API access to it and they can pull that data whenever they want. 
if it's something more complex, we can create scripts. Um, but it's very easy and very quick to spin up an interface to pull the data that another system needs. And um, Purdue has just glommed onto that all over the place. And that allows them to spin up other systems quickly sometimes, um, get the data they need without having to fight with a proprietary interface that only will do something a very specific way, but the system they're wanting to integrate with wants something different. So there's been um, a lot of savings and benefit from just the ease of integration where, yes, the SIS has the data, but they can get it out of unit time quicker. So they'll go that route. And this benefit has improved Purdue's performance in its mission of um, educating its students. Um, I mean, to get there, to educate the students, the students have to be able to get the courses they need. Um, you can offer a ton of courses. If the students can't get them, you're not educating your students. Um, we've improved the handoff of advising students to make sure students are staying on track to meet their goals. And we're improving our planning to make sure the courses are offered when the students need them and, um, and not in a wasteful way. Um, and in general, unit time itself, our mission has always been geared towards students getting what they need. Um, we provide tools to, to allow Purdue and anyone else who chooses to adopt it to see when they're not meeting student needs and identify, I mean, these tools can go down to the individual student can't get this course and they can tell you why the student can't get the course because this course that's associated with their major is scheduled at the same time as another course associated with their major and um, there's no other time they can take it. That's bad course planning. Um, we uncover that and we can say, you know, you've got to move those courses or make some change. Um, these tools give Purdue what they need to be able to do that. Has the, have these tools made Purdue perfect at meeting their student needs? No, we're far from it. We're on, the, uh, we're on a journey trying to get better at it. They do have the tools, absolutely have the tools they need to be able to improve this. And in general, Purdue is striving to improve. They are taking advantage of the tools and they're trying to bring in additional tools to interface with to make this even better. So, um, we are benefiting from it at Purdue. So the conclusion, the open source practices, they have encouraged engagement with unit time, um, not just with the advisors among lots of different applications and users across um, the Purdue system and Purdue has benefited from that. Um, so this adaptability of processes, the availability of data, um, does lead to cost savings. Integrating helps um, as well, and it does improve um, Purdue's ability to meet its mission of educating the students. Um, if you want to learn more about Purdue, about Unitime, there are, here's a list of resources that you can look at. Um, if you want to um, talk to us more, um, send us email, team at unitime.org. And thank you for your time.